subversion is basically a trope in the indie space. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris discuss enfranchisement and subversion in gaming. How do you appeal to new gamers without boring the experienced? Plus, some back talk on Pokemon Go and news from San Diego Comic Con. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 71 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. I'm back. And uh, today's media topic of discussion is going to be about enfranchisement and uh, related very closely to that uh, subversion in games. Um, This is actually inspired by an episode of uh, Writing Excuses, a very good podcast I've been listening to recently uh, by... Uh, just to give them their uh, their their props real quick, uh, Brandon Sanderson, uh, Mary Robinette Kowal, Howard Taylor, and Dan Wells, uh, where they talk about uh, writing you know prose fiction primarily, and in fifteen minutes because we don't have that kind of time and they're not that smart. Yeah, exactly. Or rather, it's because uh, you're in a hurry and they're not that smart. Oh yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, but really excellent podcast. If that interests you at all, that topic, uh, definitely check them out because it's very very good. It's a great podcast, actually. Yeah, we we absolutely love it. Uh, but they did an episode where they're talking about writing for enfranchised readers, and basically uh, what they mean by that is people who are very very familiar with the genre, uh, people. People who kind of know what's coming because they've read so much of the genre where you know they might be introduced to something early on uh, that really fascinates them but then that same book read later um, is very much like sort of paint by the numbers very tropey very predictable um, not only because they've read it but because uh, they've just seen that story told so many times now in that genre so we're gonna be talking about that sort of concept as it applies to games uh, but first we have some opening segments for you including hashtag get wrecked it's time to hashtag get wrecked with some talk about competitive multiplayer games. So briefly, I want to talk a little bit about the new patch for Overwatch that came out, I think this last week, at the time of recording. Um, they introduced a new hero named Ana, who is uh, a support sniper. Uh, the support class, uh, in general, was a little bit... Um, compared to the other classes in the game, uh, undermanned. They only had, I think, four heroes now, and now they've got five. Um, it's actually a really uh, cool, fun class to play as, or cool hero to play as, because um, what they can do is, with the, without having to switch modes, your sniper can um, shoot an ally to heal them a little bit of healing over time, or shoot an enemy to deal damage to them, just a little bit of damage over time. Um, you also have a sleep dart that kind of works at close to mid-range, depending on how good your aim is. And uh, the ultimate ability is one that lets you power up a hero, um, gives them extra damage, reduces the damage they take, so it's kind of a good little buff. Uh, There's also a grenade that does a little bit of healing in an area and prevents healing done to the enemy, so um, very high utility character. and a lot of fun to play, like I said. I'm not a super good sniper, like, with a rifle. One of my favorite characters plays Hanzo, who's a sniper, but he plays differently from your typical sniper. Um, what you can do is actually get into a very safe position and just focus on um, sniping your allies to heal them. Uh, and where you're not getting shot back at <laughs> by the enemy. Uh, and then if you get yourself in a good position as well, you can snipe your allies and your enemies and kind of be doing um, support and damage at the same time. So a really fun character to play, that concept works really great. Uh, they also made a lot of big changes to D.Va, um, a tank character, whereas before um, she felt more like kind of a, a heavy assault character um, with enough enough health that you could tank, tank a little bit. Um, but it didn't really feel like a tank because the main defensive weapon you had uh, was on a very long cooldown and only lasted for a few seconds. Now they've made it so that you just hold down the right click button um, or the secondary fire button depending if you're using a controller um, in order to raise your shields which sort of will drain and then recharge over time. And so now playing as D.Va is a lot more, you do a lot more blocking which feels more tank-like. 
Um, and so I've, I've had a lot more fun playing as this character, whereas before you just felt like a really weak, super close range um, assault character, now you actually feel like a tank. And it's uh, quite a lot of fun to play. So, uh, yeah, that's what's new in Overwatch. I underwatch Overwatch. This is Back Talk, where someone shares their thoughts on a previous discussion they missed. So I really want to thank you guys for doing the uh, the episode that you did while I was gone. Uh, that you did mm. because I would have sat like a lump and had like nothing to contribute, <laughs> given that I'm not an anime fan, uh, not a JRPG fan, <laughs> and uh, know very very little about it. So that said, in honor of you guys, I decided while I was in Europe. Um, specifically in Paris, London, and Oxford, Mm -hmm. that I would give Pokemon Go a try. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So... um, And this is before the the European release, right? uh, Yeah. Yeah. And and that's kind of the point, actually. That's Mm -hmm. one of the things I wanted to talk about, is um, I I have had a very strange um, sort of foray into the genre, because I've never played any of the Pokemans. Mm -hmm. Is that that how you say it? Pokemans? Pokemans, yeah. Pokemans? Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I've never played any of the Pokemans. I never caught me a Pokemans. Uh, I, ne- I never did anything like that. Uh, I never touched a Pokeball, I swear. Um, but, no, it, it's fine. It, as long as the Pokeballs aren't touching. There's okay, no that's that's good. Uh, but, no, I mean, I, I heard the hype, so I, I thought I'd pick it up about, mm. you know, a day or a day, maybe really two days um, into the release. And... Um, had a really good experience. Uh, they were kind of everywhere. I was able to catch them. Uh, I was doing so much walking around and, and in and out and around on the metro mm-hmm. and you know in Paris and uh, in London and, and Oxford's a city that you don't drive in Oxford. It's mm-hmm. it's like three miles across. Mm-hmm. You walk it. Nice. You know. I mean the whole it, it's the whole thing is it a medieval town. It's mm-hmm. a college town, but it's a medieval college town, and so you know the back streets and the and the walkways and that sort of thing, and you literally can't get more than a bicycle down them some of these things Mm -hmm. Um, so you're just walking down in these weird twisting little medieval alleyways and look there's a there's a Pokemon you catch it Um, and I couldn't really figure out what the big deal was from some of the people I was seeing that were posting like oh it's it's hard I'm having to go out I'm having to like dude just just turn your phone on. They're there. You just, yeah. you just turn it on. And, and I had this dorm room because I was actually taking a class. So mm-hmm. uh, I was sitting in the dorm room. And uh, I'd wait three minutes and want to show up. Mm. So I didn't really understand what the big deal was. <laughs> and then I did a little bit of research and I figured out, um, A, the the Pokestops that I were seeing, which were like every couple hundred feet, mm-hmm. that's not normal. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fact that there's a gym every uh, oh, quarter mile or so. Also, not completely normal, mm-hmm. depending on the part of the, the country that you're in, if you're playing in America. Um, and the the way that the monsters themselves, the Pokemons themselves, are uh, populated is based on population of the area mm-hmm. that you're in. Mm. And since it wasn't quite yet released overseas, meaning you had to have an American credit card attached to your account in order to be able to, to have access and download it, um, I was one of the few, probably thousand or so people, who was playing it. And the people that I encountered that were playing it were all Americans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you see where I'm going with this. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a lot of fun. It was really great. It was so much, uh, you know, it, it was great. I, I really enjoyed the, the mechanics and all of that. I don't really have much to talk about with that. Except that when I got home and I tried to play in the 100 degree Texas heat (laughs) uh, and in Richardson and Garland and Plano and these, you know, these Dallas suburbs where it's just like row after row after row of house. Yeah. And there's nothing. Mm -hmm. And the only way I can play this game now is if my wife is driving. (laughs) I mean, literally, I I just I sit in the car and I just I'm in the passenger seat and I've got it all. And so I'm not sure I can play. I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to continue to play. I had such a, a great experience elsewhere. I feel like I need to move into a small suburb that mm-hmm. actually has a high population of people who can't play. Yeah. <laughs> like like a retirement home or some <laughs> retirement village or something. Yeah, having, uh, having played a bit since we uh, last talked about it, I found that mainly what I do is when I go on walks, and part of my walk takes me past a park, which tends to have more Pokemon sure, than just sure. you know, rows and rows of houses. Um, I get you know a few that I catch along the way, nothing super rare. Mm-hmm. Um 
but we're very suburban up here in North Dallas. Um, you have to kind of go to specific spots. So one example is uh, Waters Creek and Allen has a bunch of Pokestops and stuff like that. So you can go there. You kind of like, you make trips to places to play Pokemon Go in a sense. Yeah, I did that. Which is not something I would do on my own. It's something that I find is like a fun little social thing. If you just want to get out and meet up with a few friends or whatever and, mm. you know, play some Pokemon Go while you're just doing other stuff. Um, but... Uh, unless you're living in like you know downtown New York or LA or something like so, something like that with a lot a big population density and lots and lots of Pokestops, yeah, um, it's a very different experience. You know, the more rural, rural you get, the less um, you're probably going to enjoy this game. Yeah, I was going to say if you're in downtown Dallas, there are a lot of things, mm-hmm. a lot of Pokestops, gems everywhere. Yeah, I can imagine. So it is a lot more yeah. compressed. Plus, and, um, go to Walmart. Mm-hmm. By the way, <laughs> you find a bunch of uh, this is I did try it once just to kind of see. I've actually kind of um, you tried Walmart once? Yeah, I tried Walmart once. No, okay. for Pokemon, I mean. Oh. <laughs> I read, someone said online, like, they were trying to examine why Walmart has so many Pokemon and everything. It's, like, harder to find them elsewhere. Uh-huh. And it has to do with, like, um, the number of people that... Visit that something with, like, cell, it's like It's, like, cell towers and, like, the way that Walmarts are set up and, like, the number of people that have cell phones or something like that. Huh. But anyway, Walmarts, like, if you just go to a Walmart, apparently they're, like, every step you, you take. It's like Walmart's. They're just everywhere. I found my. You uh, go out and you look somewhere else. Interesting. Yeah, I, f- I found an Abra at Walmart the other day, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I did hear that they were driving you to church. The Pokestops were in a lot of times yeah. churches. And so the reason behind that is that the Pokestops and the gyms are based on portals and Ingress. Yeah, Ingress and Ingress. Uh, the portals. What's a, well, I forget exactly the list of what qualifies to be a portal, mm-hmm. but it includes things like um, places of worship, pieces of art. So that's why like murals, yeah. statues, well, that sort community. of community. It has to have a yeah. community-minded mm-hmm. focus. So that yeah, it's not just businesses. It's you're not. Like, showing up at some guy's house. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and so anything that's eligible to be a portal basically gets translated to being a Pokestop. A restaurant. And restaurants yeah. will qualify. Sometimes. Yeah. Um, I no, find a lot of gyms and, and stops are, are restaurants. Um, it's because they have like artworks inside, that sort of thing, or murals oh, on I the see. wall. But the restaurant itself generally, Does unless it's... cultural value? Yeah, unless the restaurant itself is like an historical thing mm-hmm. or something like that, then it's probably not going to be a Well, that brings me back to my main point, which is um, literally the fun factor of finding things and in the game, mm-hmm. um, it is a really different experience whenever you're you're tagging something that is a historical piece of art that's hundreds of years old mm-hmm. uh, or thousands of years old mm-hmm. in a classic city like mm-hmm. you know Paris, London, mm-hmm. Oxford, um, as compared to Richardson, Texas. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know? and so there's just not that much. No, really cool mm-hmm. hidden stuff, weird sculptures, that kind of thing yeah. around here. Um, I don't know. In all, I make a prediction. This will be my uh, reckless speculation for mm. the day. Uh, I think that this is the year of the Pokemon the same way that 2007-ish was the year of Farmville. Mm. I think that we're going to all have played it. We're going to remember it. We're going to hallmark really important game elements mm. from it and, mm. and carry those on. Because if you think about it, the stuff that we learned from playing on Facebook, uh, whenever we played Farmville on Facebook, that stuff has carried through Mm -hmm. um, and is in just about every mobile game nowadays, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that that some of the core things like the the geolocation and the um, augmented reality and Mm -hmm. that kind of a thing um, and the way that the leveling works and that kind of... I I think that's all going to carry through into the next generation of games. Mm -hmm. Um, And then 10 years from now, 5 years from now, we're going to look back and we're going to go, oh yeah, I remember when we were all playing Pokemon Go? That was Mm kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, And when maybe we'll still be playing some kind of augmented reality Pokemon game. Mm-hmm. It may even be still called Pokemon Go, but it won't be the same thing. Right, well, and you know, and we mentioned the last time we talked about it too that Ingress um, added features as it went along, and yeah. so I'm sure we'll do the same thing. Yeah. Well, I played and, Ingress. I, I thought it was kind of cool. It's interesting though because I've talked to people who've played Ingress, and a lot of them really hate Pokemon Go. Uh, I think yeah. part of it's just because like they resent that Pokemon Go is the thing that's popular. Yeah, where they I liked it game. before it was cool. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's right. it's, it's very very hipsterish. Well, frankly, and, it never had augmented reality in the same. Sense, yeah, so. and I think the other thing about it too is that that one you kind of have to go places to play. Like technically, you can reinforce portals on uh-huh. your end if you're not traveling places. But in order to get the resources to do that, you do have to go out and go around and yep. do stuff. So and I'd- I think that it doesn't have the same universal appeal of collection. Mm-hmm. You can play Pokemon Go solo. Yes, I agree. And Ingress, it's yes a deeper game, but it's a lot more coordinated. You have to get a lot deeper with yep. it. And well, I think it's been that, called an alternate reality game. Yeah, and I think that that's a. Very significant difference. Yeah, it is. Right. Very significant. Yeah, this difference. is this is just an augmented reality yeah. game. Now, uh, two things I wanted to point out: listening to last uh, last week's pep, uh, episode mm-hmm. was first of all, um, 
GPS doesn't recognize height. Mm-hmm. So yep. you can be up in a nice tall building mm-hmm. and at the or at the bottom of the building. Um, I think that the uh, the range of your little man it's 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 there's an illusion there because he'd be like 75 feet tall Mm -hmm. if he was actually to scale with the mat (laughs) Uh, but um i think a lot of people are getting in trouble for trespassing and things like that Mm -hmm. that shouldn't be um frankly your range is so high just go around man yeah it's on the other side you know you're fine Mm -hmm. Uh, but the big thing is um like we were talking about with with ingress is if you want a great big hack what you can do is actually register for ingress and Go and look at the map page for it. Yeah, and you can see every single Pokestop all over the world. You don't have to actually be there, and you can find out what's there. So, yep. there you go. I've already researched um, my my parents' mm-hmm. town because I'm going to be there. Uh, yeah. for for my kids' birthday. So. Know the hot cool. spots before you go someplace. Yeah, exactly. And I'm very hopeful because it's a small town. So, mm-hmm. cool. Of old people. <laughs> well, following along with that, I was going to ask. Uh, there are a couple of new Pokemon games coming out that Nintendo usually re- usually releases two different versions of Pokemon coming out, in, I think November. So do you think do y'all think that this this fervor over Pokemon Go is going to increase the sales of the, these Pokemon games that are coming out for the uh, 3DS or do you think it will not affect them at all? They're obviously going to sell well. Pokemon always sells mm-hmm. very very well. I, but do you yeah. think that it might even sell more because I know that there's a lot of people that have been playing Go mm-hmm. that don't normally play Pokemon. Right. I don't think you're going to have a ton of newcomers. I think you might have a few who are intrigued because of Pokemon Go. I think what you're going to have is a lot more people who played Pokemon back in the day, stopped playing it, sort of found the love again, you know, so to speak, playing Pokemon Go, who will go and pick this one up after they've skipped several generations. Okay. Um, so I think that you might see like an overall increase in sales this time, but I don't think it's going to be super significant. I disagree um, hmm. um, wholeheartedly. I think we're going to see Something like a 25 to 50% increase in sales over this. I hmm. think that this is going to have been the gateway uh, Pokemon drug for people who have never played. I don't include myself in that number. Mm-hmm. Yeah, But I'm, I'm I, I must admit, yeah. I am tempted to pick up some of the older games because I understand that there's a... Uh, a couple of mechanics that are missing from Pokemon Go. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's uh, quite a few. <laughs> sp- specifically the idea of battling a monster right, right. to conquer it. And, and the gym battles are weird and confusing yeah, and not so, that interesting. Um, I'm actually kind of I'm kind of intrigued by mm-hmm. the by the world, by the lore, mm-hmm. by the whatever. And I think that we are seeing just a general interest in Pokemon increase. Um, you know, just quickly to close this out, I was watching just a little bit of the stream from uh, Evo, the uh, pro gaming tournament that was happening recently, and they were doing a uh, Pokemon or a Pokemon tournament. Um, tournament at Evo, and I think that, you know, they were planning to do that before, but I think that maybe if it was, like, one of those things where it's like, oh, we're not sure if we should include this game or this game, you know, one, Pokemon Tournament's new, but I don't think it's a super hardcore game. You can play it at very competitive levels, but it's not, you know, the same thing as Tekken or Street Fighter. Um, but I think that maybe the excitement for Pokemon Go was maybe one of the reasons they decided to feature that fairly prominently um, was because people are interested in Pokemon. So, hey, look, here's a Pokemon game they're playing at, uh, at Evo. And, you know, just sort of cashing in on that, that hype. Yeah, probably so, honestly. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. So um, I'm going to move on to uh, the gaming meta segment that we have here. Talk a little bit about the SDCC, San Diego Comic Con. Mm-hmm. It's a couple a couple of events that I I, I know that um, are re- gaming related or related to things that we actually care about. Uh, specifically, I remember Chris, you sent me some message while this was going. I didn't even know this was happening. About <laughs> hey, are you watching the like Sonic? Oh no, I didn't. I didn't ask say? if you were watching it. I said I wanted to mention it. Okay, because okay, <laughs> I knew yeah. you weren't going to be watching. Because you said like, <laughs> what are you even talking about? I had no idea what you were talking yeah. about. You, for those that weren't paying attention, do you want to talk a bit about this? Yeah. So they were doing this big party at the House of Blues uh, for Sonic's 25th anniversary, and. The reason I was tuning in is because they're going to be making some announcements they've been teasing for a while about uh, these new projects they're coming out with for the 25th anniversary. Um, and the first big announcement that came out um, was... Uh, oh, by the way, the stream had some issues. It wasn't the best uh, the best stream I've seen. I think they ran into technical difficulties or planning difficulties. Um, but, you know, there was this live event that was happening, and those are hard to put on. But the first big announcement was this thing called Sonic Mania. Mm. And I need to do a little bit more reading up on it, but my impression is that um, it might be a remake of some of the original um, you know, Sonic 1, 2, and 3 on the Genesis. Um, with Tails, Sonic, and Knuckles, all playable characters by default. You don't need the Knuckles you know, plug-in in order to play as Knuckles in, say, Sonic 2. Um, 
and uh, they're adding a couple new mechanics. Uh, for example, the uh, drop dash, which uh, whereas before you can run, jump, and then you could, you know, if you're stopped, press down, do the spin dash, and go. I think now you can kind of get that spin dash going while you're in the air, and as soon as you hit the ground, you'll go forward in that direction immediately, which I think will be interesting for level design and for pacing. Um, but it's it's definitely created in the style of um, those original Genesis games. The graphics, you know, definitely evoke that. Um, the level design definitely evokes that from what I've seen. Uh, so clearly, it's a it's a callback to the old games. I think to sort of one, you know, twenty fifth anniversary. You're always sort of looking back at anniversaries, but also you're trying to, I think bring back the people who used to like Sonic who have been dis- disillusioned with the newer stuff. Yeah, wash that dirty taste out of their mouths. <laughs> exactly. Like so many entries that would have been just terrible. Mm-hmm. And so they're collaborating with uh, you know people who worked on the original Sonics. And Sorry, like Will. That. Uh, <laughs> um, and so it seems like an interesting, uh, an interesting game. I'm looking forward to checking that out at some point. Um, the other thing they teased was um, uh, what they're kind of just calling Sonic 2017 at this point. Um which looks a lot like Sonic Generations, just the way they teased it. You've got modern Sonic, and then they had uh, retro Sonic short, sort of showing up there in the same way they did with Generations. So that's probably the direction that they're taking with that one. So it seems like two very sort of safe announcements they're doing. They're not trying to do anything groundbreaking. They're doing things that have been successful in the past to try to, I think, win back some of their audience. So that, to me, sounds groundbreaking for the Sonic franchise. <laughs> <laughs> just the the fact that they're trying to redeem themselves somewhat. Yeah, and they're actually trying to stick with what they know mm-hmm. as opposed to I don't even know what some of their ideas were with for example Sonic Boom, like what exactly they yeah. thought. And what that was, was going through their heads with that. And we ended up watching most of the stream um just because, you know, plans that we had for Friday nights uh, fell through. Um and so they they had some weird stuff that was happening like they were, you know, teasing the new Sonic Boom season 2, mm-hmm. the TV show. Um they had uh they announced this crossover with Hello Kitty where I guess they're doing like, you know, some special toys and stuff like and that. And I saw pictures of that too where they had someone dressed as Sonic and yeah. someone dressed as Hello Kitty standing on stage yeah. and it looked <laughs> actually quite creepy. I didn't know what was going on. It was really weird. Um, and then the uh, the other kind of uh, attraction for the evening was that performance by Crush 40 who did uh, all like the the rock songs and stuff like that for um, you know, Sonic Adventure and other games in the in the series. So that was kind of fun to kind what of What about Sonic Underground? Uh, Sonic Underground uh, was not mentioned but they were actually abandoned in Sonic Underground. Yeah, well, Sonic Underground was kind of niche. Did you know that Sonic Underground, all three of the characters were voiced by Jaleel White, also known as Steve Urkel? Uh, I think I heard that at one point, yeah. It's true. Yeah. True rumor? No, it's it's true. I know my, my Sonic trivia. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, what else was happening at SDCC that we were interested in? Um, well, they showed the trailer for the new Star Trek uh, television series that's coming to, um, not CBS, but it's like, I think it's CBS's exclusive streaming platform. Um, it's called Star Trek Discovery, and really the trailer didn't say anything about the, the story, um, what, really the setting. It didn't really give us much information, to be honest. It's Star Trek, and it's about Discovery. Right, well, so there you go. It's like <laughs> Star Trek. but um, So hopefully the writing will be good, but... Um, you know, I watched it um, a, a while ago. I just showed it to both of y'all right before we started recording. Um, and I have to say, I was very disappointed, and so it's been the outcry on, online as well, um, very disappointed in the, 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 computer, the computer graphics, the CG of the ship itself, which is really all we saw in the trailer. Um, not only is the design horrible, I think, Doc, you described it as they basically just took the Star Trek logo sort of and, logo the and made, it, made a ship <laughs> yeah, out of it. Yeah, yeah, they, they clearly did that. <laughs> it's, it's such a boring and, and just, it's not interesting to look at design. There's nothing interesting or exciting about the design itself. But not just that, it actually looks... Uh, like someone put it together, someone made the model and the textures in maybe like a couple of days at most. It looks really amateurish. Um, if y'all have kind of like last generation video game sort of quality, right? And and the the problem is, you know, you, you, I go back and I watch old Star Trek television show series all the time, and you know, especially the ones from you know the nineties and two thousands, they hold up because they used real physical models, and it still looks good to this day, and it, you can see all the detail. Whereas this. Not only does, not only is it CG, which means it's not going to age well, but it already looks dated. It actually looks like something from Babylon Five. If you if y'all have seen Babylon Five, when it first came out, oh yeah, yeah, when it first came out, it had all the the CG ships that looked kind of 
cutting edge. Be I mean, it still didn't look, never really thought it looked that great, but it looked kind of cutting edge because that was like a new thing at the time. But you go back and you watch it now, and it's really hard to take it seriously because it just looks so fake. It already looks fake. Mm -hmm. You don't want your trailer to already seem dated. And that's the thing that really that worries me about it. And hopefully the story will make up for it. But uh, I'm I'm certainly not holding my breath. I'll mm -hmm. say that. Uh, I guess the, a few other little things that sort of popped out, at least for me, just seeing people post about mm -hmm. SDCC, because I'm not really following it personally, but um, new trailers for uh, Wonder Woman, which looks kind of interesting. Yeah, the, um, I, I did see that the trailer for that actually looks pretty good. Yeah, a lot of cool. like um, World War World War One, yeah. um, which. I thought it was pretty well done, mm -hmm. personally. Uh, and then the new Justice League, which... Yeah. Uh, th that trailer wasn't as impressive to me, personally. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also one of those things where both of them looked pretty cool, but then so did Batman vs. Superman at first. <laughs> so, uh, And then like as time went on, he started to get less and less uh, optimistic. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, but I think most importantly, of course, is the Lego Batman trailer that they came out with. Uh, <laughs> most important. More, most importantly. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I figured I, I made sure to mention it to, to y'all Especially Doc, because I know that you're a big Lego fan. I, I am. Um, yes. I'm not a fan of Lego Batman personally. Sorry, don't, <laughs> okay, so don't kill me. But <laughs> I, I actually did not understand this until I watched the trailer. Uh -huh. This is not a Lego um, uh, game mm -hmm. uh, in the vein of the other Lego games right. about the Batman movies. Mm -hmm. This is a game about Lego Batman. Mm -hmm. From the Lego Movie. No, oh, it's, it's no, a no, no. It's, it's a game. movie. It is a feature-length movie. It's a follow-up to the Lego Movie. Yes, but it's Lego. It's not a game. It's a movie. Oh, yeah. see, I was still not getting it. <laughs> and, and, but you're right about the, where the character where the character is based from. That's right, he's, he's based from the from Lego, Lego film. Movie, yes. Uh, so now this is a feature-length film. Yes. Yes. See, I thought it was a trailer for a game. Nope. No. Well, see, then, then it failed as a trailer, because I failed to understand what it was. Well, it was called Lego Batman the Movie. That was what it said in well, giant yeah, letters at I the end of it. Well, yeah, but I thought that it was still a game about the movie. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm with it. Okay, so instead of it being a game about... Uh, the, the Lego, or, or Batman the, from the Lego movie. Yeah, instead of it being a Lego game about the, the uh, a movie, mm -hmm. Batman movie, it is actually a, uh, a movie mm -hmm. about Lego Batman. Yes. The, the Batman in wow. the Lego movie. You're, you're blowing my mind right now. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I'm sure it will appeal to people that, that really like that kind of wacky mm -hmm. sense of humor. For me, I, it didn't really strike a chord with me, but I can totally see how some people will love it. I mean, my nephew will probably love it, mm -hmm. you know, he's... I'm sure he'll think it's hilarious. So I, I had a lot of fun with the Lego movie, and so far the trailer looks like it's going to be pretty funny. So Yeah, uh, yeah I'm with I, you on that. B Batman was one of the highlights of the Lego movie for me, so basically just spinning off of that. So. Isn't it... Isn't it... Um, Will, isn't Will Arnett play the voice of Batman? I think you're, I think you're right. It sounds right. In that movie, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, who, al who also... In, in the Lego movie as well. And, and didn't they get Michael Caine to do the, the voice of... Uh, uh, Alfred, or that, at least an that impersonator I, that I don't know. It sure sounded like him. I will say I did. I did like the bald cap thing that he was wearing. Yeah. Oh yeah. The the headpiece that yeah. he had on the Lego. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I thought that was that was that was good. Um, well, more on that as it comes out. Yes. Uh, yeah, and there were actually a lot of there was some announcement for Injustice Two. If anyone's interested, in that's kind of a Mortal Kombat. Mm -hmm. um, style fighting game with DC characters that mm -hmm. actually was pretty popular. Yeah, and I kind of like, I think I've mentioned before, I kind of like the premise of that game as a way to justify uh, pun, no pun intended um, superheroes fighting each other. You kind of have like this DC Civil War thing going oh, on. Oh no, it makes it makes sense. It takes place in an alternate universe which mm -hmm. actually I, made, I liked as well. Mm -hmm. um, I've read some of the comics uh, from it as well and uh, admittedly a lot of the characters are acting out of character but the whole premise of it is that Superman goes rogue because mm -hmm. Lois Lane gets killed, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah, and, and so he's, he's kind of the villain, but he's like he's not like a like I'm pure evil mm -hmm. villain. Of course, he's a he, guy. He just who, humanity can't govern itself, so we're going to just sort of rule with an iron fist because we know. Right, it. he's doing it for essentially he's doing he's doing bad things for a good reason, but yeah. other heroes are opposing him, and he's not going to mm -hmm. put up with it, kind of thing. Yeah. So I don't I don't like that version of Batman, but I think it's an interesting story. Everybody has or, bad days. Or Superman, you mean? Superman, yes. Because like Batman's uh, resisting. He's like the had the resistance. Right. So. Right. Well, they had to have them oppose each other. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> uh, I do like some of the designs they had in that one. Um, they're using the Blue Beetle from the new Blue Beetle um, that sort of has um, a Iron Man-style armor. It's actually a sentient alien 
<laughs> armor that sort of sort of adapts and like molds. I really can't wait for them to do a feature film with him. I'm surprised they haven't because mm. the character concept is like a cross between Spider Man and Iron Man, hmm. which are both very um, popular characters. You know, it's a teenage character. You would think it would be a slam dunk for a feature film. I'm still baffled they haven't made one. It's probably just because uh, there's not enough name recognition. Recognition. Well, yeah, but how many films has Marvel made with zero name recognition behind? Well, it? they they've built up that like okay, we know it's a Marvel movie now, so now we can do Ant Man because people like Marvel well, enough that we. But can. that's what I'm saying. I think <laughs> I think at this, but I think at this point, there's so many superhero movies that you can just put one out and people would at least be interested. Yeah, give it a chance. Like it wouldn't necessarily like run to the theaters, but mm. if. If you put it out there and you have an interesting trailer and the concept sounds cool, people yeah. will check it out. Mm -hmm. I think we're at that point. I now. think I think DC is just a little bit behind Marvel in that regard, as yeah. far as getting to the point where they feel like they can comfortably do that. Right now, they're having to rely very much on very big names, and even then, they're not. Well, they're they, not as critically acclaimed right. as Marvel's been. Well, they don't. They don't have to rely on those names. Is what mm -hmm. gets me. It's like they just they choose to. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's the but yeah. I know. The, I know what it's, you're the, it's the money I, behind it. I disagree it. with what you say about not as critically acclaimed. By the way, it because depends. the three the three Nolan Batman movies have been have but those, higher critical reactions than any of the. Marvel I agree, films. and I, I like those so. um, a lot. I, the problem is that the DC universe films, in the same way the Marvel has its cinematic universe, yeah. Um, like you know that being separate from X Men, for example. No, no, you're right. Like but, the Batman trilogy is a standalone thing. Right. But there's been two DC universe films. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. Yeah, and that's why they're behind. Yeah. Meaty topic of discussion. Like I was saying before, this idea came from a podcast I listened to about writing for enfranchised readers. Um, people who know genres really well, who see things coming because they're so familiar with the tropes and the archetypal storylines and that sort of thing, that... Um, it's kind of hard to please them. You know, they, they'll read something and they read it because they're into that genre, but then, you know, they're not surprised by it or um, they find it boring because they've heard it, you know, all, the, all these different things before. Like, even if you have this cool new idea, it's not enough to make it interesting. Um, and sometimes, too, people try to come up with these ideas or these subversive elements that um, seem on paper to be interesting or seem in concept to be interesting but that aren't executed very well. Mm. You know, if you're going to try to mix things up, you have to do it right or else you're just going to make people angry. So it's kind of this catch-22 of unless you really nail it, you know, people are going to be bored or they're going to be upset because whether they know it or not, what they wanted was something really familiar, if that makes sense. And so I wanted to apply this idea to uh, gaming, you know, and franchised gamers who know, you know, either game genres really well, and I think it applies both to game narratives and to game mechanics, sometimes both in the same game, where, you know, people who play first-person shooters mm -hmm. expect certain gameplay elements, and yet they get bored if it's exactly the same as what they've played before. You know, you got to come up with new mechanics, um, you know, even sometimes in the way that you tell the stories, um, um, you know, sometimes you try to mix genres a little bit there. So, like, we have this shooter, but we're going to try to, like, you know, have something more interesting narratively than just the very linear shoot, shoot, cutscene, shoot, shoot, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but if you don't do it right, um, it can be problematic for you. Yeah, I think um, I was kind of looking at this when you introduced this topic, and I, I do think it's an interesting one. Um, one of the things that I think gets gets game developers in trouble is when they say, I'm going to make a first-person shooter like X. And that's their whole design philosophy. Mm -hmm. And they're not really thinking of, um, here's the concept that I have for my game, and mm -hmm. they're not trying to fit it in any sort of box. Mm -hmm. That's when you get a good game. You know, you're not necessarily trying to make the next Doom, or mm -hmm. you're not even necessarily trying to make... Um, it is going to be a run-and-gun style first-person shooter. You're just trying to make a game with this core concept, and you're not constraining it. Yeah. Um, that's that's what I think uh, it leads to more creativity because mm -hmm. you, you're not limiting yourself to um, what you already know or understand about the genre but at the same time you're not you're not so worried about well wait a minute uh, we don't want it to be just like X mm -hmm. we want it to be kind of different oh but how different but yeah. we still want so you add that extra um, element that makes it more challenging the other point that I wanted to bring up and I had to, to look at this because I, I, I had heard of it before and I had forgotten the name of it. Um, but it's a psychological concept known as fluency. Mm. And it, it kind of goes sort of in contrary to what you were talking about with, with people not necessarily liking it, but I, I think it's still related and relevant here. Um, and the idea is that um, the more fluent something is, which, in other words, the easier it is for you to process mm -hmm. and understand, um, 
that actually makes it easier. That actually makes it more likely for you to like it. Hmm. So, um, as so, in other words, as you um, because you understand the way that the story is supposed to unfold, or because you understand the way these mechanics are supposed to work, mm -hmm. um, you you get past that initial moment where you're having trouble understanding what you're doing or what you're seeing or what you're reading, etc. Depending on what genre we're talking about here, mm -hmm. and it allows you to appreciate all of the you know subtle subtle ways that this particular game movie. Um, novel, whatever, mm -hmm. differentiates itself yeah. from from the pack. Yeah, and so if you make it, if you if you go in completely knowing nothing about it, that's when you actually have a harder time. Right. And if you think about it, if you just hand like you know, grand grandma McGee, um, a a controller, and she's never played video games, and maybe it's a great game, maybe mm -hmm. it's you know, a, maybe it's a seminal game like Super Mario Brothers three or something, and you just give her a controller, she's probably going to have a really tough time initially. Yeah. Whereas if you give someone else that already knew, especially people that already had an understanding of the original Super Mario Bros. When Mario Bros. By the time Mario Bros. Three came out, people were able to get, pick it up and just go mm -hmm. and, and run with it, and they were able to appreciate all the ways in which Super Mario Bros. Three um, was different and improved upon right. the, the mechanics and style of the original. And, and yet, it was also very similar in a lot of key ways. Mm -hmm. And that's something they that actually touched on in writing excuses when they were talking about, um, you know, trying to trying to deal with this because the thing is, you're trying to appeal both to the people who are new and to the people who are enfranchised, who are very experienced. And so there's this balancing act that has to happen mm -hmm. where you need to have enough of the familiar to for it to be comfortable for people to understand it, right? Um, but at the same time, you want to have... Um, you want to have enough new elements, like you said, you know, sort of going from Mario Bros. to Super Mario Bros. 3 to keep improving and to keep making things interesting um, for the people who have been around the block. Um... And the other thing they mentioned, too, is that there can kind of be um, what they call, like, you know, gateway books or gateway stories. And I think that it applies to in games where you have either for, like, a, a long-running franchise or for a genre, um, a game that kind of introduces people to it for the first time, kind of a new generation, if that makes sense. Um, so you have... Uh, you know, an example that I've actually cited before on the podcast is, um, you know, we've talked at length, so I don't want to dwell on Fallout too much, but we've talked about Fallout and how, for me, Fallout 3 was my first experience with it. And now the old school Fallout fans will, you know, lament how terrible Fallout 3 was compared to the originals. Not all of us. <laughs> um, I but, think it was heavily flawed in some very key ways. Exactly. So. New um, Vegas was significantly better. Right. That's, that's my just, least favorite. That's just an established fact that New Vegas was better than 3. <laughs> um, but what happened for me is that Fallout 3 was my first exposure to Fallout, period. Mm. Um, and having not played a lot of Elder Scrolls, for example, that was my first exposure to anything in that vein. And so for me coming into this sort of for what for me was a new genre, um, Fallout 3 did a lot of stuff that really spoke to me, did stuff that I've never seen before, and then became my springboard into the world of, you know, choice and consequence driven, you know, multiple path RPGs, if that makes sense. Um, something I'd never really seen before. The Fallout 3 did for me that probably the original Fallout and other games like that did for you guys. Um, oh, see, that you took that in a direction I didn't expect you to go, actually. Mm. Yes. Yeah, I, I thought you were going to say post-apocalyptic video games. So did I, yeah. And you didn't. Which brings us to a really important point that we've talked about on, on the podcast before, which is why are genres in video games defined by their play not necessarily by their setting. Mm -hmm. Whereas in most other forms of fiction, mm -hmm. we'll call it fiction, um, it is. Well, whether that be a TV series or a movie or a book, you say, oh, what genre is it? Oh, it's science fiction. Mm -hmm. But um, obviously Fallout is science fiction, but we don't, we don't classify it as science fiction mm -hmm. as a video game. We classify it as, uh, oh, they broke it when they went from that three-quarter isometric view, uh, turn-based, over into real-time first-person crap. Mm -hmm. I completely don't think that's why they broke it at all. I completely disagree with that statement. But some people would say that. Well, some would, but I think the biggest criticism for Fallout 3... I don't think that, by the way. Right. Yeah, I don't think that either. I think what actually the issue that I had with Fallout 3 was I felt that it really simplified a Binary lot of, morality. Yeah, a lot of the choices in the morality systems of, particularly Fallout 2. Sure. Which actually, that was this big thing. It had all these like tribes, and, and it wasn't focused on 
good versus evil. It was focused on the way that other people re reacted to you personally, and that was very nuanced based on all the little different civilizations. Well, and that brings us to a really important thing to answer the big question of enfranchisement, I think, <laughs> which is, which story are we telling? Are we telling the player's story, or are we telling the 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 story of the designer, developer, writer, you know what I'm saying, the creative mm -hmm. director? Um, if you go through um, Bioshock, for example, you're going to have fundamentally the experience that Ken Levine wanted you to have. Right. Um, not when you do two, because he wasn't on that project. But uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the the game itself, while technically non-linear, and you're going to have your own um, version of the playthrough, and when you play it again, it'll be different than the first time you played it. And all. We can talk about those subtleties, and that's that's what makes video games video games is that you are in control of the character but ultimately when it comes down to the story of that game the message of that game um, the uh, the would you kindly moment all that stuff it you're going to have the experience that was curated for you in that moment as me and we can have a discussion on that level mm -hmm. we get to something like Fallout or Skyrim or something like that where the moral choices are so blown out that um, oh so did uh, did you nuke uh, the town or did you not nuke the town oh interesting mm -hmm. um, did you uh, did you kill everyone to beat the game oh you did how how interesting you know what I mean mm -hmm. and so uh, I think that the idea of enfranchisement isn't about the story you're telling um, anymore whenever you have blown the choice out that much mm -hmm. but I think it, it could be with something like. Uh, Bioshock. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm going with that? No, but I think even with so with something like Fallout, you still have that effect where it's more: Are you familiar with um, the genre, or in the case of Fallout, are you familiar with the series? Like, for example, one of the reasons why I loved Fallout New Vegas so much was because they had a lot of um, references and callbacks to Fallout Two. I agree with that. Because it was designed by people that that were behind Fallout Two. Yeah, Uncle Fergus. So, yes, and so they um, intentionally they also went back to the the more nuanced morality system from Fallout Two. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of like. Um, yeah, if you were familiar with Fallout 2 and wanted to play a game more like Fallout 2, this gave you the opportunity to do that um, with uh, some of the mechanics from Fallout 3. And to your point, Doc, I think that's you know why I mentioned earlier that you have this interesting dynamic in games as opposed to books, which is what Writing Excuse is focused on. Yeah. Um, because it's interactive and because it applies both to the narrative and to the gameplay. Um, and, you know, we can kind of have two separate discussions, I think, on how do we tell stories in games and how do we avoid being cliche or being too tropey and, you know, kind of mix things up in that way. We could also have a lot of discussions about just purely the mechanics and the systems that you include in your game. Well, just to build off of that, too, I mean, I think, we, and it also goes to what you are saying earlier, Doc, about why do we define games in mechanics versus story? And it's a big part of that is um, you're, be, that's basically what a game is. That what differentiates a game from a book or a movie or a television series is that um, you have this element of interactivity and otherwise it's not really a game. So we generally speaking when someone picks up a game, they're picking up a game because they like the style of play in that game and not necessarily the world that that game is set, is set in. Even though that is like something that might, might draw your attention. Like for example... I know people, and this is not me, but some people really don't like action-based games, like shooters. They just sure. don't like shooters. So it doesn't matter if they're a massive fan of, like, say, um, you know, zombie, mm -hmm. post-apocalyptic zombie stories. Mm -hmm. They might love Walking Dead, love that kind of stuff, but they they don't want to play a shooter that is that kind of game. But they see the they see Walking Dead. They like say they like story games. They see the Telltale Walking Dead games. They're going to be drawn to that instead mm -hmm. because of the setting. Well, but because they also like story games, is what I was saying. With games, you're initially looking at the genre itself, and then, then everything else just informs that choice. Yeah, I, point, yeah, I, I think that sometimes you might have a, a story or a setting that's intriguing enough to someone that maybe they're willing to stretch a little bit outside their comfort zone to try something out, or right. maybe and the that, gameplay does. And that happens sometimes, stuff. too. Yeah. And I think that goes back to what I was saying before with genres, because I think one thing that's important for us to consider is that you know, we as consumers, we're the ones that are classifying games into genres. Mm -hmm. It's not the developers. Typically, they're making a game, and they have, or at least theoretically, mm -hmm. they're making a game that they that they have a certain concept in mind about what they want that game to be. That is not. We want this game to be an action platformer, 
slash roguelike or whatever. Yeah. Like they're not they're not thinking of it in that way. Later, when it comes out, or when pe- when people get a chance to play it and see trailers or whatever, they start classifying it in that mm-hmm. sense. So I think that's the, that's another part with genres, which um, maybe you could say kind of goes to what you were saying, Doc. Um, in film, they actually are trying to make something like a Western. They actually are trying to make a science fiction story. Right. So there is a little bit of a difference there, where in, in gaming, I think, even though the mechanics are the driving force, um, it's... I don't... I, maybe I'm wrong, but this is from everything that I've read from developers. Typically, they're not saying, I am going to make an action, pla- action platformer slash um, adventure game. Like they generally don't think of their game in that way. They think of their game in, you know, like the elevator pitch, like the one, like here's my concept for my game, just like someone does for a movie. Now that concept will include the mechanics because that's part of what the game is, mm-hmm. whereas a movie won't. Mm-hmm. But in a movie, you're typically going to be throwing in buzzwords with the genre, mm-hmm. whereas you're not typically you typically don't do that with a game. Well, well I you think, do, but they're very different. I think in games, like a lot of times, the elevator pitch. And you does. can, you can too. Yeah. I'm not necessarily saying you don't. I'm just saying. You wouldn't throw in the same buzzwords. I agree with you. Right. Yeah. And I think in games, a lot of times people for their pitch will throw in something like it's like game X meets game Y. You know, it's like it's a Zelda but with these elements or something like that. Yeah. That's that's a yeah. way that people try to mix things up nowadays. Is by uh, and this is the same thing with fiction actually uh, that they mentioned in writing excuses where they will blend genres. They'll b- borrow tropes from a particular genre to kind of put a new twist on that and also freshen things up for the people who are used to the genre that you're living in, so to mm-hmm. speak. So, for example, anything with RPG elements. You know, you have uh, Borderlands is a really good example. It's essentially a shooter, but it has a lot of RPG elements borrowed from things like Diablo, you know, maybe arguably World of Warcraft, as far as, like, you know, the quests and the ability to build up your skill tree and to have different play styles depending on which character you choose or which build for that character you choose. Um, that sort of you put those two genres together, and this is an example of it done really well, where you come up with almost an entirely new genre because you've blended these things so sure, differently. Yeah. Um, and that's a way that you can sort of mix things up, but you also run the risk of if you don't do it right, kind of upsetting fans of both. <laughs> yeah, if that makes sense. Well, I think a great example of this actually is in in the uh, Assassin's Creed series. Mm-hmm. The Assassin's Creed series was sort of a surprise hit, and it hit in that magic moment around 2008 or so, whenever graphics just really hit the plateau, mm-hmm. and we were finally up on top of that plateau. And it's a perfect metaphor, because, I mean... Assassin's Creed is all about being on towers, and <laughs> but um, is there is there a bale of hay at the bottom? Of the yeah, plateau? And there's a, there's a there's a bale of hay at the bottom of the plateau. Um, but what you had was um, a team that very uniquely uh, was a hundred people, and they realized if they doubled their budget that they could have two hundred people and get it out twice as fast, and that was working. So they doubled it again and got it out with four hundred people, and then they were like, okay, so now let's split the teams. And you guys, you go work on two, and you guys over there, you go work on three, and we're going to get two and three out in rapid succession, we're going to have an Assassin's Creed out every single year for the next however long. And originally it was a trilogy, and then it became more, and all this stuff. What's interesting is, two was uh, an extremely great game. It was it was in some ways the best that one of, of them that has come out. Um, since then, they've done a lot of other innovative things, but in terms of the... Uh, like the controller and things like that. People really genuinely gen- generally agree that 2 kind of was the peak because it perfected the stuff from 1. Mm-hmm. The problem is 3 was developed in uh, tandem with 2 and they were not communicating with each other, really. And so what happened was they also sort of extrapolated out from 1 in a different direction. Mm-hmm. So that whenever we got to 3... They had this little narrative explanation for it. Oh, well, we've updated the Animus, and you're going to find that some of your controls are different. Mm-hmm. And they are bad. And they went a different direction with it. So that by the time they got to some of the other games, they kind of retconned it and they fixed it, and they, they sort of went back a different direction. One of the reasons people didn't like 3 is because the controls were so different from 2. Not that different from 1. And 2 wasn't that different from 1. But... Three was so vastly different from two, and it was because those two games were, were developed simultaneously. Mm. So you get these really weird things that happen in this industry with stuff like that. So I think that when we talk about enfranchisement, um, we have to talk about it on multiple levels. Mm-hmm. Um, what am I expecting from a uh, Metroidvania, if you will? Well, I'm enfranchised with Metroidvanias. I expect a certain thing mm-hmm. to come along. Um, 
And that's why whenever we play Shovel Knight, we judge that mm. based on other stuff. Well, it's it's retro. It's trying to be retro. But so. it can't be too familiar or else it's derivative. Or else it's derivative. Yeah, you're yeah. exactly right. And that's completely different whenever you look at the controls, whenever you look at um, typical sort of setting genre, mm -hmm. and whenever you look at some of the other elements like writing and things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, I think... I think video games are a little more complicated mm -hmm. than even books and movies and TV in that regard, and that we have to, we can't oversimplify by saying it's just the controls, mm -hmm. or it's just the setting, or it's just the genre, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and something else that I wanted to bring up, too, is the indie space. Um, you have a lot of games coming out in the indie space, and it's not exclusively indie, granted, but, uh, for example, you have a lot of retro likes and throwbacks coming out of the indie space. And I think that a lot of that is people who are enfranchised and have been playing a lot of games, especially the mainstream games that have been coming out in recent memory, are kind of, you know, tired of the the sort of same old, same old that we've been seeing because people do play it very safe. They try to innovate here and there, mm -hmm. but it's it's very sort of like safe little and, steps. And it's little things that they throw in too, mm -hmm. like constant tutorials mm -hmm. or making you watch cutscenes every like few yeah. steps that you take. And so people who are tired of this sort of thing uh, sort of yearn for the old days when it was like you know back in you know NES and SNES and that sort of era mm -hmm. where like you know games were so much better back then. Um, whether or not they objectively are or aren't, or, you know, I think that we could we can break down, and we have many times in the past, you know, kind of some of the actual differences between old games and new games. Um, but the impression is that, like, hey, you know, the, this older generation of gamers are just gamers that have been around for a while, have been playing all this stuff, get tired of what's out now, and want to go back to what they remember. And so you have these retro likes coming out from indies that are, you know, basically just very derivative of the stuff that they liked, you know? So it's it, it happens... I think both ways, like both with modern, like, you know, recent people and people who have been around longer, the enfranchisement has different effects on them. You know, it's kind of like we either want to fix and subvert what we have now or we want to just sort of go back and maybe fix or subvert what we had back then, um, if that's making sense. Um, and I think that what ends up happening uh, with indie stuff, too, is you kind of put this modern spin on old stuff that's kind of just appealing to nostalgia. Um, you know, and that's the, what I was going to say. Yeah. The, the aesthetic, I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with the aesthetic. It's just you see so many of these retro likes because people remember that aesthetic being associated with stuff that they liked. Right. Yeah. Um, no, there's, and there's no problem with, I think... I, I want to move a little bit away from the, the, the idea of, like, you're, they're always trying to subvert, mm -hmm. because I really do think that there's something to be said for you know exactly all of all of what this genre can do. You mm -hmm. understand exactly how it's supposed to work, whether mm -hmm. we're talking about a narrative genre or, you know, me mechanical genre, mechanics and games. You know exactly what it's supposed to do, so you're going to set out to essentially make the very best version of mm -hmm. that. Sure. So there, there is that element of it as well. Mm -hmm. And I think there's been a lot of success, or there can be a lot of success doing it that way. You don't necessarily have to to feel like, oh, I have to do something different for mm -hmm. the sake of being different. Yeah. And I think that that's part of the problem, too, is that so many people in the indie space especially, I've, I've said before the now that subversion is basically a trope in the indie space. You almost expect there to be some sort of a subversive element, whether it's right. narrative or whether it's gameplay. Um, and that's not inherently bad. It's just that it happens so often, and often it doesn't happen very well <laughs> that it starts to become an issue. But I think that you can sort of have like a very sort of pure, refined experience, too. Um, and you're not going to appeal to everyone. I think that's especially true in games, because it is both narrative and gameplay. Mm -hmm. You try to appeal as many people as you can, but you do have to know your audience, too. Um, and I think it's the same in fiction, it's the same everywhere, but you can kind of appeal to as broad an audience as you're able to by sort of blending well the expected and the unexpected. Yeah. In fact, I, I think that if you're doing it really, really well with the enfranchise, what you're doing is you're giving them an opportunity to expect and be right almost. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I think that we could have a whole other episode about that in being a good GM. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's what being a good GM is. Yeah. It's giving your players the feeling that they've almost lost. Mm -hmm. Or giving them the feeling that they almost died. Or that they almost failed mm -hmm. at getting the MacGuffin. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. It's about... Um, and, and with, with any literature, I think, it's about anticipation. That's the reason we read. That's the reason we play. That's the reason we watch movies. Mm -hmm. It's because we think we know what's coming five minutes, five seconds, mm. 
um, five milliseconds from now, mm -hmm. and when we're right and no one else is, we mm -hmm. love it. Yeah. And whenever we're right and everyone else was also right, and we were all just like predicting it, we're like, ah, you called it, yeah, lame. Yeah. You know? and, and so I, the the double reversal is mm -hmm. great. Yeah. And, and then the triple reversal, which mm -hmm. is the modern yeah. uh, reversal. And that's that's exactly <laughs> the thing where like if you're going to subvert, and you know, subversion can be a very broad term here. Um, of the like, they see it coming, and then you have this twist, but it can't just be this arbitrary out of nowhere thing. It has to make sense. Yeah. And it has to be, as I've said several times at this point, done right. Yeah. Um, do it wrong and you basically just ruin it. If you can actually fool me into thinking that my first guess was wrong and then it turned out to be right, mm -hmm. you have succeeded gloriously in my opinion. I, I really think if, if I can nail it from the beginning and you can convince me I'm wrong and then and then it turns out I was right, I mm -hmm. think you've got it. Or, and this is something that they actually mentioned too um, in writing excuses, was the idea of being surprised by something and then you go back the second time and you can see how they telegraphed it. Um, but you aren't surprised because you know it's coming. Right. But you could totally see it coming and so you see that they weren't cheating you. Yeah. It wasn't like the surprise that came out of nowhere. They did foreshadow it. They did telegraph it a little yeah. bit. But they also were able to kind of... Well, and that plays heavily into replayability, mm -hmm. which we've talked about. Again, I'll mention Bioshock. It's the one game I've played more than any other game and I know exactly what's coming. You know, I'll, I'll go see Romeo and Juliet in the theater without any hesitation. I know how it ends. Shakespeare tells you how it ends within the first five seconds of the narration. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's obviously not about this is me guessing the ending. It's about, okay, I'm, I'm telling you straight up how this is ending. Now let's find out how we got there. Mm -hmm. I'm actually kind of reminded of God of War, the first one, where mm -hmm. he's falling and about to be, you know, he's, he's dying. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing's a flashback. And you're like, whoa, how's he going to get to that place where he's dying? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I think, keying into that idea of anticipation for the enfranchised and unenfranchised, disenfranchised, <laughs> the unenfranchised alike. Well, it's like if you know, if you know the ending, and that kind of, that's kind of where I was going with the, with the concept of fluency, and it also ties into um, spoilers as well, because that was part of uh, various studies have also shown um, that even though you think people would, would feel negatively about, say, a film if they knew, if they knew the ending going into it, mm -hmm the reverse happens and they actually end up um, enjoying it more and part of it is because of the fluency effect but part of it is because just because you know what's going to happen doesn't necessarily mean that you know how it's going to, going to unfold mm -hmm. and point. there's still that element of um, discovery when it comes to okay I know that this is supposed to happen but how is it going to happen and because you know what's that it's coming eventually you're able to pick up on those, those uh, cues like mm -hmm. you were talking about before all the little foreshadowing elements mm -hmm. that lead up to it I think that that's an interesting uh, point that we can carry into games where, mechanically speaking, um, you know, you have the gameplay genre. You know, it's a, it's a shooter, it's an RPG. Um, you kind of know, even if you know how the story's going to go, it's about how you get there mechanically, too. It's about how you sort of, you know, plan. If there's any planning involved, it's how you sort of approach the strategy. Um, you know, even in something like, um, you know, Telltale games with story story driven games. Um, the choices you make along the way, you can kind of guess what this choice may or may not mean. Um, but because you're thinking about where it could go, it makes the choice kind of interesting and meaningful. And then sometimes if you're surprised mm -hmm. by what the choice does, that's kind of an extra little boon right. for um, how things have gone. And the one element, and I know we're, we're up against uh, our time here, but just one element I did want to mention, because I, I think it's something that we have to at least point out. Uh, the big difference that between games and uh, film story, not just the interactivity, but the fact that many of them are challenging, mm -hmm. requires some skill to get through. Mm -hmm. And so even though you might recognize this this genre mechanically, you might know exactly how it's supposed to play. Um, you might know exactly that, okay, I'm going to go through this level, there's going to be some hazards, and I'm going to fight a boss, and mm -hmm. I'm going to go on, and the boss is going to have to be beaten in a certain way. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to succeed. Mm -hmm. So that element of challenge is also something that is going to, you know, inspire you and push you forward and, and keep you um, interested and motivated to want to win, even if you know exactly what's coming. Mm -hmm. And that's why you can play through a game like Bioshock that lets you approach the enemies in multiple ways and beat them in different ways. Um, it can it keeps that fresh and exciting as you play through it again because you don't have you're not you're not approaching every single room and every single enemy and every single big daddy fight in the exact same way you're approaching them differently than that. you were in each playthrough and yeah, that, sure. that keeps it fresh every time yeah 
So I guess uh, kind of final takeaways then before we wrap this thing up. What do you guys think, um, and we'll sort of break it down into like kind of two answers, for game narratives and then for game mechanics. How do we deal with enfranchisement, dealing with the people who are experienced and kind of know what to expect and might be bored, and also dealing with the people who are newcomers who you're trying to accommodate, if that makes sense. First of all, I would say, um, one... You can't please everyone, mm-hmm. so just please stop trying, because that's how you end up with crap. Every time, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to go out and say it, every time you see like a film that just that just feels like um, cotton candy, you're just going to eat it, and then you're going to be done with it, and you're never going to remember that you even ate it in the first place. Mm-hmm. That's what most uh, films that come out now are, and that's what a lot of modern games have turned into, unfortunately. Yes, that's, right. that's because they're trying to just... Um, go for that factor of, oh, this is really cool, and throw a bunch of, like, kind of cool things at you that have no deeper meaning, yeah. and there's no reason to go back and, and watch it again. There's no reason to go back and play it again. And, there's the unfortunate, and that's because they're trying yeah. to appeal to everyone. And there's the unfortunate thing that happens where they have, like, this really cool pitch, like, oh, hey, it's, like, this game that you really like, and then we've also added this element of blank, and it sounds really promising, but the execution is such that it doesn't right. really deliver on the promise. So I can't tell you how many times I've played, like, say, a game that says it's going to have interesting choices and consequences. And then doesn't. And, and doesn't. Yeah. Um, I, I think I can boil that really down into kind of one sentence, and that's just to say, don't be afraid of the haters. Because if you have, if you put out a product that people hate, and not... And, Obviously, it's the internet. People will hate things for stupid reasons. <laughs> but I mean, if they legitimately hate your product because they not because they just go, oh, it sucks, mm-hmm. but like they have a legitimate critical mm-hmm. reason for for hating it, that means you've probably made something good mm-hmm. because there's other people out there that will probably love it for the exact reason that that person hated it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's actually a funny example that they gave in writing excuses of. Um, uh, one of the authors had written this book that's a blend of fantasy with magic and stuff like that, but also Regency romance. Mm. And so <laughs> what? they they said that um, they got a review where someone really loved the Regency romance aspect of it, but then they kind of ruined it when they introduced uh, the magic system uh, called Glamour. Um, and uh, it, like you know, then it was great until they introduced Glamour, which I think they pretty much just made up. And it's like, well. You caught me. <laughs> you know, it's like Gee. so. It's one of those things where like the the mix of Regency romance with fantasy works really great for some people. But if what all you want is Regency romance, then you know you're not going to please everyone. Yeah, and I guess my answer to the question is when it comes to narratives, mm. the good narratives, the the truly resonating narratives, the ones that are going to last a hundred thousand years, that kind of thing. Mm. Um tell the story don't don't worry about whether or not someone's enfranchised or not mm-hmm. yeah because ultimately everybody gets enfranchised if they read enough of the same thing yeah mm-hmm. and one of the reasons they do that is because they love the story mm-hmm. you know everything's a tolkien pastiche mm-hmm. does that mean we shouldn't read tolkien mm-hmm. eh. you know it's it's different with mechanics i think there's ways that you can design teaching fundamentally into it and we've talked about that in the past but mm-hmm. I think if you're going to have that kind of a, a tutorial mentality you also need to have a skipability built into it mm-hmm. that um, for the people who get it yeah get that, it. and then that sense I think you can design for both the new player mm-hmm. and the old player there's going to be games that are obviously meant for um, seasoned people mm-hmm. who love this franchise mm-hmm. or they're just not going to get it. And that's that's an advantage that video games have over linear media like movies and books. Mm-hmm. Um, and those, everyone has to get through everything. Whereas in games, we can have variability. Yeah, we can say, you can you can skip over this part or oh, oh, you cha- for, change your difficulty. For like a tutorial. Oh, okay. Because I was going to say that there's definitely there's definitely um, um, price of entry, I guess you could say, for, mm. for films as well. There's oh, certainly sure. films oh, that, yeah. that you will not understand unless you have some sort of a background within that right. uh, within that space, within that genre, within mm. that subject. What and often, though, they, they go into those films understanding that this is a film for film buffs, you know, just as an example, um, and not necessarily like something that you're trying to pitch as, you know, the summer blockbuster that everyone's going to go see. Well, and that hits to the heart of my problem with the new Star Trek is that they're trying to be the new Star Trek that the old Star Trek fans will love and the new Star Trek fans will also love. Don't don't try to please everybody. Either reboot the series and call it a reboot and leave Leonard, Leonard Nimoy out of it, um, or, you know, actually make something that has continuity. So, And I think to kind of uh, round out, you know, my answer to the question, I think, is... Um, 
you know, there's no easy answer to this. Um, and I think I agree with you guys, you know, don't try to please everyone. But if you're going to try to innovate, you're going to try to mix things up. Um, you know, don't be afraid to try interesting new mix-ups that you've never seen. Um, I don't think that anyone really ever thought of a shoot and loot like Borderlands um, until they happened to think, like, hey, what happens if we d- combine Diablo with the first-person shooter? Um, and it turned out great. And I'm sure there have been other genre mashups before in games that have not turned out so great, you know? Um, so, you know, don't be afraid to experiment, um, but also give a lot of good thought to when you do experiment and you do try to do new things or sort of remix things um, in order to be you know new and original and creative. Um, give it some good thought and actually think about what would work well together. Um, and a lot of times it really comes down to the same thing with any sort of creative work. Make something that you'll like, something that you no, genuinely like true. yourself, and chances are that somebody else is going to like it too. Actually, no, I'm 100% unique. something that i like everyone else must hate because clearly no one likes what i like (laughs) yes we're all unique individuals (laughs) we're all special except for me (laughs) i'm kidding but no that's that's actually a really good point chris i I think that's very important for people to 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 realize and remember that you know something that that it might feel like a very personal story to you and i'm sure that it is Mm -hmm. that's going to resonate with us with other people and not just one or two other people Mm -hmm. lots of other people even if they haven't experienced exactly the same thing that you have Mm -hmm. and that's the power that's the power of storytelling right Mm -hmm. there is recognizing that your personal story is Mm -hmm. going to resonate with other people and Mm -hmm. you don't need to be afraid to to get that story across and 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 share it with Mm -hmm. other people and importantly too when you're trying to innovate you know it's important to make sure that whatever twist or whatever change you're bringing in is well executed and it's good but don't forget to make the 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 normal stuff the 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 base, if you will, interesting as well. Um, you have in, in prose fiction this problem that happens sometimes where you have this big twist that you introduce, want to introduce, um, but authors feel the need to kind of like do their time and have everything be normal for a while before that happens so that the twist is a twist. The problem is that yeah. they don't make that beginning part interesting, and so you might lose people before you even get to the interesting part. Heavy rain. <laughs> <laughs> um, just just watch a lot of old episodes of Twilight Zone, okay? Because <laughs> generally speaking, they, most of the time they do it pretty well. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for episode number 71 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, our talk on subversion and on enfranchisement. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.